started. I can see that a lot of folks are still joining, but just to keep us on track and give us enough time to really have good discussions, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I just want to say hello to everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Um, if you've joined us before, you know that this is our third uh, one in our series that we've started this spring on network leadership from the field, linking the research to practice. Um, today, I'm going to introduce Dave in a, in a moment, but we're um, hosting a webinar titled The Six Characteristics of High Performance Networks for Network Leadership. And I'm just really excited about this, so we're really um, pleased to see so many people join, joining us. So. Um, one quick little housekeeping, we love to keep abreast of what people are thinking and um, talking about when these things are going on. So make sure if you are inclined to, you use your hashtag, um, hashtag network leaders if you're on Twitter. Um, that way we can kind of, and we're hoping to use that hashtag just as we move forward in all of our endeavors um, to really keep our conversation around network leadership um, current. All right, so um, moving forward, we are... Um, here, so Dave, if you could move the slide forward, that'd be great. Yes. <laughs> so we're here today um, talking about network leadership. And so what is network leadership? We kind of want to cover that early on. Um, but what we have found is that there's lots of folks out there that are really deeply involved in networks. But what we also know to be true is that people are not necessarily finding ways to gain skills and information on how to build knowledge and really understand how they should both participate in a network and also manage networks of people and organizations. So network leadership is really a leadership framework where members of networks build skills together to use data to make decisions. So we really believe that being a network leader isn't just about being a great person who knows how to connect to other people, but that you really are using evidence, data, and skills to really understand how to do your work. And so Towards that end, our mission is to help engage people and um, build a network of, of leaders ourselves and offer opportunities for people to really think and learn about that. Um, so at the University of Colorado Denver in our Center on Collaborative Governance, we host a year-long year workshops like this, webinars, and um, one annual leadership uh, network leadership uh, training Academy in May. Um, and the webinar series itself is our opportunity to learn more about research skills and practices for engaging in what we call the network way of working um, and really to help um, bring back folks who we've worked with before. So you'll see today Dave and almost all of our presenters are people who have um, worked with us in the past. So one more scheduled for the spring before our NLTA and that, um, so be sure to sign up for that. It's on April 21st from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. To Developing a framework for high impact collaborative, a funder's perspective on network leadership. So we're going to have a United Way um, a person here named uh, Joe Mendica, and he has been part of a, long, a real long process for developing this framework for high impact collaboratives. It's amazing work, so be sure to sign up for that one as well. Um, and then just uh, one more kind of announcement of an opportunity is our Network Leadership Training Academy. So this is where we met Dave, who you're going to meet today, where we've met all sorts of people who are both thinking about how to train and lead um, this kind of work, but also people who are engaged in network leadership, the people who are in practice trying to implement networks across the world. And so this is a three-day training. This is our fourth year for it. Um, called the Network Leadership Training Academy, our tagline to build, manage, and evaluate effective networks. This year it'll be May 16th through 18th in Denver. Um, we, you can't click on this link, but um, if you uh, go to the same website where you registered for the webinar, you can find information about the NLTA. We'll post it here on Twitter and also on um, our follow-up emails. But uh, come and join us. It's, it's about half full already, so be sure to register early if you can. We have a slight discount if you register before April 4th, um, but we want to have you here, so we hope people who, like-minded people who are on this call will want to come and, and join us and learn from each other in, in May. So um, that's about it for, for what we're doing and why. Um, and I am more than pleased today to introduce Reverend David Hackett. So David is a senior network advisor and associate director at Vision 
this energy. And as I mentioned, we met Dave through our NLTA, and um, I've learned so much from him and just been amazed at his ability to stay connected and be a network leader, um, both for us and also for so many people around the world. Vision Synergy develops globally strategic Christian networks and partnerships and their leadership towards maximum collaborative impact in critical areas of world mission. So be sure if you, uh, to visit that website. You'll see they have not only information about what they do, but amazing resources. Um, and Dave currently advises major international networks operating globally and in the Middle East. North Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America. So I don't want to take up any more time because you'll see as Dave goes through this that his work is unique and pretty special. So um, Dave, thank you today. Um, oh, one last quick thing. Um, we are going to do a Q&A session at the end of this so that you should have a little button at the bottom that says Q&A. And as you think of questions, be sure to go ahead and um, queue them up there. And then at the end, uh, we're going to turn our videos off so you can focus on the presentation and then we'll pull them back up and do the Q&A at the end. Um, and, and I guess one last thing, I, I guess I didn't say, I'm Danielle Varda from the University of Colorado, uh, Denver, and I, I run our Center on um, Collaborative Governance. Um, so, uh, but, but really the, what I'd love to do now is, is uh, turn it over to Dave and, and um, just say thank you, Dave, for, for offering to, to help share this work with us today. Yes, thank you very much, Danielle. And thank you, too, for the whole team. Um, and uh, I've gone to two of the NLTA meetings. Um, they've been a, a wonderful addition. And, and what you're doing here is um, a wonderful contribution to the, the world of networks. So thank you to everyone there. And also, it's a remarkable group of people on this, um, this call. I want to note that we have a PDF of this slideshow that you can download even now. Uh, at um, bit.ly, bit.ly, March NLTA. Uh, we, we're going to be looking at, um, at six characteristics, um, but I want to give an introduction to, uh, to this at this point. And uh, let me turn off my video so that I can focus on speaking to you. Um, Six characteristics, and before I begin to that, I, I want to look at um, what we have come to call as uh, high performance networks to differentiate them from barely operating, uh, barely productive networks. And um, if we're investing time in a network, especially if we're a key leader in the network, uh, I'm sure that we want our networks to operate with excellence and to have uh, its efforts land right on target and I've known both uh, high performance and lacking performance networks, and maybe you have as well. And so I'd like to start with telling a tale, a true tale of uh, two actual networks, one definitely not high performance and the other succeeding at it. And I won't be naming these networks um, really to protect the innocent. <laughs> the first I'd like to call the lost in the board um, network. And it had a grand plan um, let's see, I still want to be on this one. It had a grand plan, uh, a crucial vision. It even had a full-time paid facilitator, even a lot of money to get it going. It had a board uh, of some, some high-powered people, and it even had connections on, on the, the ground uh, with people. But the facilitator and the board could never really seem to agree on a coherent strategy to tackle the problem. And it was as though they didn't even want the network to succeed or actually address the challenge. It was quite, quite odd. Uh, and in the end, um, the facilitator was able to travel overseas um, several times, and he kept proposing different strategies to the to the board. Um, but the board, uh, sh you know, shot them down, and uh, the network collapsed, and the facilitator exited um, finally with medical problems. A sad. Uh, situation there. But let me describe another network, and this is this one has succeeded under terrible conditions uh, and beyond anyone's hopes. And in this situation, very few of the key uh, players um, talked among each other due to security problems in that uh, Middle Eastern, North African situation. There was no collaboration at all. Uh, individuals worked with diligence, really, but nearly all the information flow was stopped up. 
and they had no coordinated follow-up program. Uh, they were key players, um, but they didn't have any national level projects in the country. They didn't have a plan to en enhance their language skills uh, so they could uh, do their work better. And over the last 20 years, there have been several failed attempts to draw this set of folks together. And really, most thought that it couldn't be done. But uh, we brought in um, a, an effort here that turned this into a high performance network. And it started with a neutral facilitator coming in to guide them through a whole process of discovering how they could work together, what it would take, what they needed to safely work together. And that neutral facilitator convened them, helped them find their priority sectors of work, uh, immediately got them to agree to meetings um, every 90 days. And over the last four years, uh, they've formed and routinized secure communication practices. Those were vital. They developed work teams, each with a um, committed leader. They grew in size. They developed three regional follow-up teams to cover the country. They developed major projects, dramatically changing the situation. And, and then to establish um, full leadership, they uh, chose one of their own to be a, an in-country facilitator. And, um, and our involvement shifted out. Now, this was a wonderful uh, situation where we see um, vision working beyond problems. And this is crucial for high performance uh, teams and networks. They're successful when they're led by uh, visionary leaders who decide that uh, collaboration is vital and, and they also choose to think beyond their own organizations. Um, this is uh, being captured by a vision that is not just their own methodology, but uh, allows for a whole set of ways to do that. They were able to see the whole and how each could contribute. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, in the in the um, uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew five. Just one verse here um, in, in Eugene Peterson's translation. It says, "You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family." And I'd like to put that into network terms. Uh, high performance networks help each individual participant to say, through this network, I've discovered my place and role and my organization's place and role in the larger picture. I can further my organization's purpose better by engaging deeply in the network. And my network involvement helps me achieve my personal and organizational vision. So this is uh, how we see, begin to see successful networks by developing a shared focus on what the problems are, and those may be challenges and dilemmas, uh, and they create a shared drive to address them. So vision beyond problems. We'd like to start off by learning just a little bit more about who is on this call. So if you take this short poll, we'll get a little view of that. Can you put up the poll? So Dave, you might not see the poll, but it, it, it's oh, going, and, it's and you should see the results there soon. That's right. It's not showing okay. on this end. OK. Uh -oh. So Dave, do you see the results for the poll? I do not see them. <laughs> Okay, well, let, they're up, so let me read them to you. So about 38% of the folks on the call say they are network facilitator leaders or weavers. 12% picked network facilitation team member. 15% said a network member or participant. Only 2%, one person said network funder, um, and 7% network advisor. And then a, a big group, 27% said other. Okay. So I'm sure folks probably could have picked more than one of those even, but um, our two top groups there are network facilitator, leave, leader, weaver, and other. Well, I'm thrilled uh, to have all of you, your, your colleagues and, um, and uh, your people I, I really respect. And I'd love to see uh, 
you know, how we can all grow together in this role. We've really found that um, high performance networks don't happen accidentally. Really, they're marked by specific characteristics that set them apart. And I'm going to share this list of uh, six characteristics that begin to map out uh, what, what we've seen makes a difference between a, a muddling along uh, network and a high performance network. And here they are. Let me briefly uh, state them first and then go individually through them. So we have network uh, engagement and ownership, how people feel they're a part of uh, the network. Limited achievable objectives as people begin to uh, form uh, concrete objectives that they can work toward. A clear statement and constant restatement of the vision so that people know the larger framework, uh, why we're called together, what we're working on together. A clear definition and assignment of key roles so that it's clear who's, who's working on what, what team am I on, and so on. An active coordination or facilitation team and what kinds of role that team has that leads the network right to what NLTA is, is all about. So let's look at these and begin first with um, engagement and ownership. High performance networks gain uh, a value that is uh, perceived by all the people in it um, long term with genuine engagement and ownership and contribution and this perceived value that's both the network of the individual participant and organization and the organization of the network. So all of these things are elements to work on. Um, and this is where we see that a network um, does both uh, benefits me and benefits we. Um, there's a place for us. We're together after a cause. And it happens um, when a network is uh, a level field where despite the differences we may have in methodology, uh, the role we're playing, we are, are united in working toward the vision that we're trying to address. And we have a bias toward inclusion across different methodologies. And that can be very hard for organizations to step beyond. Um, I urge them to uh, networks to look for what's one echelon up from your specific methodology of addressing it. And um, uh, you have a purpose beyond or above your own arrived at conclusion of how to address it. That's where others come into, into play. And, and um, they're also after the same vision, very similar vision, so we can join together. I was on a webinar recently with uh, Jane Way Skillern. Um, she's author of Cracking the Network Code, and, and she talked about this. High performance networks have each organization doing what it does best, leading to the network serving more people more efficiently and effectively than ever before. And I agree with that. I, healthy networks extend the reach and capacity uh, far beyond what any single organization can, can uh, achieve. And at their best, networks find their identity by what they accomplish doing, not just by being a network. So it's all about accomplishing something. And um, uh, that's a, a, a critical uh, feature of high performance networks. And here's, here's how we uh, find networks able to get to that through lim limited achievable objectives. Now, that's just the same term as uh, SMART. Um, uh, term, but it, uh, we find that people even have trouble remembering all, all uh, five of the <laughs> SMART terms. So we use LAO, Limited Achievable Objectives, and what that means is that um, uh, they simply break down the big vision into smaller accomplishable elements in an overall strategy to realize the great dream. And um, we, I have a favorite slide. Um, that I'll show here. This one <clears throat> shows uh, how we typically approach things. Model one, we begin with a big vision, uh, a grand vision. It's, it, it, it's healing a neighborhood or a city or, uh, or a people, a 
country, a region. And, and we come out of that with an immensely big plan. And what happens is as we try to implement that plan, we have really maybe severely limited outcomes, um, what actually comes out of it. And people's negative expectations are fulfilled, there's disappointment, and that leads to just like a balloon with the air escaping, declining hope and vision. Uh, vision Synergy, we, we um, really want to promote and urge you to, to maintain that big vision. That's essential, that's what draws the whole together, but adopt instead limited achievable objectives at each point and have those um, ones that you can succeed at, you can fulfill those. And it, uh, it raises commitment to the future, it builds encouragement, uh, we're able to affirm each other, we're able to learn how to work together, and it results in, re in rising hope and expanded vision. And that's what you need to go back through the cycle again, do another set of uh, LAOs, and keep moving forward. It's kind of chipping away at this major thing. So let's take a poll at this point, and I am not going to be able to see the poll again, uh, but this asks you um, about, about your uh, limited achievable objectives and how that's implemented in your own network. Uh, so please take this poll. So what we're trying to, to hear, to have you think about here is um, to what degree you're uh, segmenting um, an approach to tackling your project into, into parts, into elements that yeah. you can work on. Great. So our results came up, and Dave, sorry, I don't know why the poll's not showing up for you, unfortunately. Um, so the question, how would you evaluate your network's ability to break down its big vision into limited achievable objectives? So most people, almost 40%, said we are doing reasonably well at doing this. Good. Um, 20%, uh, a good split there, about 20 and 22% said we're stuck on getting to this. We've begun to do this. Um, and then 14% said some do it and some don't. And mm -hmm. then just a small 6% said we have made this a standard expectation and practice. Well, we'd like to, to um, help you uh, find how you can do that. And, and that is a, a concept that you can develop um, uh, even yourself intuitively. But um, there are some additional resources that we have on how to help uh, you develop coherent limited achievable objectives, help your work teams develop them, and, uh, uh, and thus experience success and accomplishment so that you learn. Our, our uh, kind of our statement on that is, you know, we can't do a lot together until we learn how to do something together. So let's have a very limited initial set that launches us uh, successfully. Um, a, a friend of mine, um, Bruce Larson said, um, your first time down the chute needs to be a positive experience. And I love that phrase. It means that, you know, the first time you try something, if it's positive, then you'll probably go, go again. And, um, and we want that in networks. So, uh, okay, so the, the third uh, element or characteristic is a clear statement and a constant restatement of the vision. Um, and uh, we find that those in high performance networks have very high proportion of their people uh, knowing the overarching long range vision, the, the purpose for the network is very, very clear. And it's stated again and again. Uh, we had a friend who was um, on uh, one of the large foundations um, here in Seattle tell us that um, at the top level leaders meeting of this foundation, um, they would begin the time by sharing the same, this is every meeting, by sharing slides, uh, uh, the same 12 slides on the mission of the foundation. Um, as, if, as if we were saying, gentlemen, this is a basketball, <laughs> that kind of um, basics. What it does is it brings us together again Everything that we talk about from here on out should be advancing that long-range vision 
and purpose. Another uh, characteristic is a real clear definition and assignment of key roles. And um, we have found certain key roles uh, that really help a, a network uh, get traction and movement. So visionary committed leadership in, in each of these roles um, is important. And here's some of the key ones that we have found uh, essential. A network facilitator. And this is somebody who helps steward the network. Uh, they're an encourager. They're a prompter. Um, they're an orchestra director. Um, there's many different ways to, and different temperaments, actually, that you can be a network facilitator. Um, but someone who really helps uh, center the group. And a communications facilitator begins to help us realize that um, communication and collaboration are very tightly connected. And so how the group uh, talks with each other, how they work through the year, um, how they uh, keep keep people uh, up to date. Um, these are all very important th factors. Working group facilitators are those who really help um, segmentation of the tasks to happen. And one of our interesting insights is that um, interest increases with specificity. So the more interesting, the more specific a task is to what you yourself and your organization are really wanting to work on, the more your interest goes up. So that's a great advertisement for working groups. That lets people choose among the various um, tasks that a network is working on, the item that has particular interest to them. And um, working group facilitators, of course, can help bring people in, establish a le level playing field, um, help them know their task in, in and um, and there's kind of a, a, a an accountability that can begin to happen there as as uh, the facilitators work with the group and then event coordinator um, meetings uh, face to face meetings are um, we found pretty essential to uh, they're they're not uh, the only way that networks uh, that want to be high performance can meet. But, um, but a well-designed, uh, well-agended gathering is, um, sets the stage. Uh, and that's how we would, we would desire you to think of, of events as stage setting or as preparatory. They're, they're setting the stage so that the action can follow. And they're not ends in themselves. And um, I'd also add here that, uh, Network leadership also helps to ensure that evaluation happens. Um, how how are we doing? How how can we measure if we're making advances? Um, how can what what is there that we can count uh, that would be substantial to showing that we're getting forward movement? Um, this this kind of shows a, a pattern that may be uh, helpful for you. Um, events are, are always uh, preparatory for what comes next, and the FT stands for a facilitation team, and that meets uh, regularly in some, some fashion. That may be monthly or bimonthly or whatever. It depends on what your, your network is about. And then there are working groups that meet um, uh, perhaps virtually or face-to-face, -face, and they are, they are as well meeting, uh, meeting occasionally. They may let, meet less frequently than the facilitation team, which is trying to keep tabs on the whole thing and until there's another event and, and you begin again. So this, is, this sets into motion a, a year-long, through-the-year uh, pattern of making forward progress. And a fifth is an active coordination or facilitation team. And um, in this, uh, we found that here's a real difference maker um, for high performance networks, a proactive coordination point uh, for this facilitation team, which keeps the strategic focus and, and ties all the pieces together. And um, I want to look at this through a couple of lenses. One is the kinds of actions that they do. Um, and now, a neutral 
third party, in my first example, um, that made all the difference. Sometimes in some situations that you want to address, um, a player isn't in a position to convene and lead a network because they can be perceived as um, a competitor or as a as challenger or wanting more glory or whatever. And a neutral third party uh, can provide an essential start um, and we, we consider it as kind of a secret ingredient that makes a difference. Um, a neutral advisor would, would not be a player in the field but would be somebody as fully informed on the dynamics of the field that you're trying to address. For working groups, um, again, uh, high performance networks would divide the challenge into teams that allow people to specialize in their area of interest. And um, that uh, gives, gives them a, a, a role and a place. Regular meetings um, brings about continuing engagement and uh, this is where uh, that first network that I described decided to meet every 90 days. Uh, it, br it brought a degree of accountability and forward movement. Uh, everyone was able to see and note uh, progress that was happening or lack of progress and begin to address that. High performance networks know the power and purpose of meeting face to face. Um, there's denser communication that happens, motivation, getting on the same page, and it furthers a sense of we. Uh, the main purpose, to repeat once more, is to prepare the next set of actions. And um, a lot can be done when you're face-to-face, -face, but that's not all that can be done. And then c the role of communications, and I've mentioned this with the communications facilitator, but uh, finding a way that uh, allows everyone to be in touch with one another. Now, in many situations that we work with, uh, security, secure communications are vital. That may not be the case in your, uh, in your situation, perhaps, but it, perhaps in um, medical fields, for instance, uh, it, it, it's mandated that uh, communications must be uh, secure. Um, and so there are many situations to, to be aware of. What is it on communications that in your network audience is vital? Um, and address that. Find, find out what that is and uh, scale up to something that is appropriate for everyone. And then facilitator. Um, really, the, a key to success is this facilitator who is really in touch with those who have responsibility, uh, encouraging, suggesting connections and resources, uh, getting updates on progress and, and linking people, uh, and in turn sharing the progress with the rest of the group and the, with the wider, wider network. And I put in that word trained because um, many of us assume that we can just, if we want to, we were able to lead a network. But the skills we found are 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 very particular to an interorganizational uh, network leadership. It it's not the same way of leading, and and if we assume that it is, uh, we'll soon run into people who will remind us that it's not uh, that we're not their boss, um, and um, they they are there for their own purposes as well. So uh, having a trained facilitator is vital. And that leads me to this uh, sixth uh, characteristic of high performance networks. And that uh, has to do with intentional support and training for network leadership. Um, high performance networks will have multiple people in their leadership team who, are, who have really looked deeply at uh, collaboration, the network way of working, and um, have access to ongoing coaching and support as they do their role. Now, um, this training is something you're going to have to look for. Um, in most leadership training is within a team, as in a within an organizational team. But there are different dynamics for interorganizational uh, network uh, leadership and. 
that's why we, we have to look specifically for this kind of collaboration training. Uh, high performance networks have a continuing plan for training and input and mentoring uh, to span, um, it, that includes spanning personnel changes, uh, the director or, or facilitator or uh, facilitation team leaders, those rotate through. And so we have to continually provide for that kind of uh, ongoing training. And it's something that we at Vision Synergy have found critical for health and effectiveness of, of networks. And that's why uh, we host an online learning community for Christian network leaders. Uh, that's at um, uh, www.synergycommons.net. Uh, I have a link for that at the at the tail end here, but it's an open community and anyone is welcome to um, browse and, and to join. But to seek that kind of training is very important. And so just to sum up again, these six characteristics, uh, we've talked about engagement and how to, how to, um, uh, how important it is to provide ways for people to have buy-in into the network uh, for LAOs, which break up uh, into doable parts, this big vision that drives us together, a clear statement so that everyone knows um, why we're here. And, um, and it reminds them to set aside those things that uh, would otherwise disrupt our uh, community together, but um, drives us to do something, uh, to, to gives us the assignment of our task and then clear definition and assignment of roles, uh, and then what an active coordination team uh, works on and provides for the network, and then this role for training. And here, again, I'd, I'd put in an advertisement for the NLTA because it's a wonderful group of, uh, of people that are peers that you're able to come together with. Uh, many of us on this call have been to it. and. Um, and know that it, it's so encouraging to be able to dive into some of the um, dynamics that are that are very present in networks and and for network leaders to have a way to move forward. I have a poll here now to ask you uh, what which of the six is most um, troublesome for you that is the biggest challenge uh, for you to try to get uh, a handle on and let's see what um, you might indicate there. We'll give you a chance here to get in your, to log your thought on that. And as folks are doing that, be sure also, if you have any questions for Dave, we're gonna get to those real soon. We, we have some queued up, but that's uh, the spot to put Good. them in. So, yeah. So it looks like, okay, so, so oh, Dave, now it's showing. They are. Now it's showing. Oh, great! First time. Terrific. Good. Okay. So with engagement and ownership, and uh, and it's a tie, isn't it? Uh, intentional support and <laughs> training, and um, then it shows that NLTA, um, Danielle, you're doing really well at 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 uh, at addressing one of the felt felt needs here on this, um, and it shows too that people are really desiring what helps people to step up and uh, be responsible and, and to have a sense of ownership um, in their roles in, in the network leadership. So that is a crucial thing. Thank yeah. you. Uh, okay, let's uh, just to give a, some, a set of uh, resources. Um, we have a paper that's on these six, six characteristics that covers many of these topics. And there's a, a Google link Synergy Commons uh, is what I described, a collaboration community for network leaders. We have um, over 400, 400 on it. So these are, this is a place for peers to interact and have forums, um, discuss things, and, and uh, look at, there's resources gathered there. That's synergycommons.net. And then we have a, a large uh, media library, all kinds of case studies and games and uh, workshop recordings and so on at visionsynergy.net slash resources. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and this is where we have 
uh, scores of different practi practitioners give short video talks on different aspects of um, network leadership. So these are real people um, around the world who are talking about uh, what they face as network leaders. And those are not only entertaining, but they've got nuggets in them of how real people are handling things. We've created a, a little tool called the Essential Guide to Effective Networks. It's a one page, a big one page. We've tried to get everything that we talk about on one page. So you can imagine uh, uh, the, the size of the font. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good one. It talks about the different stages of networks, leadership, uh, tasks, um, tasks, and challenges, and so on. Um, there's a collaborate video that I'd point out to you. Now, this is on a Christian uh, theme, but it shows the development of, uh, of a network and how they, how they took steps to grow that. This was produced by uh, Create International, um, which is a, another, uh, another organization. And it's in English, Chinese, and Korean. And then I, I put in a, a sheet uh, just to elaborate on, on consultation leadership roles uh, that's available at that link. Um, it just shows when you do have a consultation, what are some of the uh, aspects to be aware of and, and provide for for an excellent consultation. And so now we shift to Q&A. And uh, we'd love to welcome your questions and have a, have a time of that. I think you're on mute. Sorry, I said I was going to restart my video <laughs> um, and get going. Um, so I, I just wanted to start saying we have been kind of watching Twitter, and there's good activity there. So thanks, everyone, for participating that way, too. And Dave, I don't think there's a time I've ever heard you speak about anything without learning something. So thank you so much. That was just Terrific. Um, and there's a, a bunch of questions, so we're going to get started on those right away here. So I want to start with one that is um, kind of broader than some of the others. So one, one participant asked, how were the characteristics identified? Are they based in practice, research, theory, or some combination? Well, excellent question, because um, these are ones that, that we have found over uh, over decades of uh, network leadership, so they would be ones arrived at not not through uh, confirmed uh, research, but but they keep showing up. They keep showing up to be the the determinant factors that uh, we begin to see some somebody that some organization, some network. I'm sorry that uh, that attains uh, that high performance level, and uh, these are just going to be uh, starters. You know. These are, these are the big peaks, and there's lots of smaller peaks to work on, but these are some of the very fundamental uh, aspects that we've experienced as making a difference. All right. Good, good. Okay, so a couple of specific questions about the roles that um, mm -hmm. leadership, the kinds of leadership that you need. So one, can the network facilitator and the communications facilita facilitator be the same individual? Certainly. I mean, everything, the, the rule is, you know, st uh, structure small. Don't overstructure. Um, the role of structure in a network is uh, to be as minimal as you can be and still fulfill the mission that you have in front of you. Um, so that may be, you know, no office, no budget, no staff. Uh, and it may be that uh, there's a conflation roles that that begin to expand as you have leadership uh, and and you gain some sense of that uh, yes mm -hmm. the communications um, can but it's a role that must be addressed how are we how are we building communication in so that there's nobody left out out who needs to do, to know something and remember yeah. knowing information contributes to buy-in if I'm informed or know that I can find information I'm I'm included. And so that's an important role to have in a network. Perfect. 
So the, I'm going to guess that the follow-up one on that was whether the, uh, roles like this need to be a full-time person. Um, and that kind of blends with that and with what you just said. Yeah, they um, really, they, they, could, they can, they could be, but then they also typically in the networks we work with, they're not at all. These are people who have full-time uh, uh, positions that they're, they're working on. And this is really in their volunteer um, section of their life. And, uh, but some of them, you know, have, uh, are dedicated to that, maybe some portion of their life. And um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, or it's also fulfilling part of their assigned role for their work. So mm -hmm. there's a, there's a crossover yeah. between what the network, network is helping them fulfill what they're otherwise charged with doing. Excellent. So I, this is a great question and it really, I think it really speaks to a strength that you bring to this work um, that very few others do. Um, David, so this question says, Dear David, spiritual commitment and energy come through strong and clear in his presentation. I wonder whether he could speak to ways in which the network can support the spiritual development of its members, or put differently, how networks can help create and support a common identity, shared vision, and sense of personal and collective agency. Well, the biggest, biggest for what we experience, and I didn't include it in this, but is uh, a fundamental of prayer. And so building, building a sense of um, uh, common spiritual um, commitment and, as it's expressed in prayer is, we found is in our Christian networks is pretty important because that then uh, powers the, the vision. It powers our, our uh, willingness to risk. It helps us um, stay together. And um, it's remarkable. Uh, and I don't know quite, you know, I haven't experienced um, networks where there's no role uh, of, of that kind of something that pulls us together. Another aspect, of course, mm -hmm. in, in uh, Christian networks is worship. So some sort of joint worship um, that helps set the stage and helps us to celebrate and, and, um, and to, um, you know, to have a good time. So those are elements and and i i speak highly of them because i experience them all the time and um i don't know i'd have to kind of think to think of counterparts for uh for secular networks but i but i wouldn't underestimate at all the role of celebration uh affirmation mm -hmm. um and uh and and a vision clear enough that 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 we all look look up to it you know that's that that has to be that that would be kind of the counterpart. It has to be something that is attractive to us, a, a desired future that we're willing to put some degree of ourselves on the line to to seek after that. Great. Sorry, I was waving someone off right there. Um, thank you, Dave. I, I really do think that that's really helpful um, to have such diverse people who come into this world and bring such information, you know, from all aspects of ways that we think about managing and working in these, in these network ways. So um, I really appreciate that. So real quick, there's two questions about funding. So folks are asking questions about thoughts on funding for high performance networks. And then also, um, uh, you know, someone who specifically said they're a global network of health research agencies, 55 agencies in 33 countries. So where's the best place to look for funding sources for networks? Wow. Um, you know, f well, first a preamble, uh, funding agencies also need to know the vision that you're pursuing. So it has to be something that they're, they're interested in, in pursuing. Um, and they may also be, um, What's interesting in funding agencies is that they're they're the ones who are approached by multiple people wanting to address a similar task, and so we find them to be some of our best advocates for collaboration. They they would love to see you know this set of people who've approached them individually work together, and um, so that's one one reason. Um, another is in for that's vital for securing funding is. Uh, good metrics and how are you going to evaluate is evalu evaluation mm -hmm. happening what are the actual outcomes but when you're talking about how do you find it um, uh, you may have you, you're gonna have to start looking first at um, okay uh, what aspect of this appeals to to a given uh, uh, um, funder so listen well 
know that the different, that's one reason you've got different working groups is that there may be a particular working group focus that's of interest to a particular funder. So you have to learn about uh, what, what is the interest uh, from the funders. They do have interests. They're not just looking for, you know, kind of in general good things to fund. They're, they're looking for, uh, uh, they have an agenda and, um, and that agenda can resonate really well with your network. So uh, study them, talk with them. You might uh, very openly say, um, here's four major emphases that we have in our network. Which of these uh, are, might you be interested in? And let them tell mm -hmm. you that, um, well, this one is, is really, that's, that's what you know, we're, we're really uh, wanting to grow in and, and uh, be involved yeah. in. This, this set, not. Um, so yeah. I, would, I would encourage people um, uh, begin to look for foundations that have funded uh, projects similar to yours uh, and networks. Um, and, uh, and then uh, try to secure um, a way to interact with them on what you believe they may be interested in. You can also find that out through uh, 990s, the, um, the, the tax mm -hmm. forms, what they have funded, and that can be a, a kind of a clue for you to understand what's going on. So, and I just wanted to add to that, um, you know, next, our next month's presenter is a funder who can also speak to this a little bit, like how they're prioritizing funding for collaboration and networks. And I just wanted to add in my, in my experience as well, um, almost any foundation, even the federal government, almost any funding agency now is including components of collaboration in their work. So you might not be, you might not want to look necessarily for someone who's funding a network, but they may be funding the topic area yes. that you're working on. And you'll find that if you uh, um, propose a network approach, you're chances for funding are going to be increased because funders do have a, a real focus right now on funding networks Good. so and collaboration. Um, True. So, so um, let's see, uh, there's, there's a few, there's, there's still quite a few here. So, um, but this one um, is really speaks to, um, well, let's see, you just, let me ask you this one next. So there's a little bit of, a few questions here about evaluating networks and looking at measurements. Um, and this one says, how do we measure or what are the indicators of successful and engaged networks? And you kind of, you just mentioned evaluation briefly in your last um, response. So um, specifically they say, you know, just looking at how often folks interact might not be sufficient to really understand whether that's a high impact collaboration. So maybe you could speak no, to that for a minute. No, it's, I mean, that may be really re relevant to understand understanding the nature of the network and uh, the strength of the connection is important there. But no, on, on, um, on evaluating the, the outcomes, uh, it, it, there's a big difference, of course, between output and outcomes. And it, output mm -hmm. is what, you're, what, you're, what you're, your actions you're doing. But how is it impacting the results? How is it impacting the audience? And for that, um, there are good resources out there to help you understand that. One tool that our group has found very helpful is um, just working with a, with a theory of change or outcomes-based um, uh, management. And uh, there's a number of terms, logical framework, but uh, this helps you understand what are, what are you setting out to do uh, and what, what are you f doing to address that. Um, you do this so that this happens, so that this happens, and it becomes a chain. And you can measure those um, impacts. Right now, one of the big challenging aspects of this is um, is a is a really well informed uh, person that that uh, that mentioned to us that really it's hard to determine um, impact uh, in the short term. It really, you know, it really for many of the networks that we're looking at and working with. Uh, outcomes um, are things that, can, that really are best measured over years. And um, mm -hmm. so to try to get um, uh, short-term uh, measurable uh, outcomes is, is a challenge. And um, so is ascribing impact. Uh, this happened because of this. Uh, well, maybe it happened, but it didn't happen because of that. 
And so we have to look at uh, uh, causation and correlation. Um, let's see, another aspect is, um, uh, well, asking, asking ourselves, um, uh, what qualitative or quantitative uh, outcomes uh, are we desiring? How is the future going to be different for these people? And, and, uh, and how can we tell if it's different because of our interaction with them? And increasingly, mm -hmm. of course, um, funders as well as just supporters and, and network mm -hmm. participants want to know, are we making a difference? And, and really, if, if you're not, uh, you know, that that may be that may be um, reason. Networks don't exist just to be a network; they exist because mm -hmm. you want to see some some change happen. And right. so that's why metrics are increasingly they're kind of a bane. They're hard. They're a challenge for us. Uh, do gooders, you know, want to just do good, but we're trying to see well what what changes by what we do. So that's why we right. get into metrics. Good, good. Well, and, and I'm just going to plug our partner tool just briefly that we, that's one way that we use the tool also is to try to better understand relationships between people. So um, if you need a, a resource for that. Yes. But um, so, so Dave, we just have a few more minutes, but th there's two questions here that are um, really related and they, they both kind of speak to both the diversity in which um, happens when networks come together, specifically maybe from your perspective in an interfaith community, mm -hmm. but also just working cross-culturally across networks. And so, you know, um, how do you basically develop shared objectives when you are dealing with folks who have different value systems, cultural and race issues that may be in opposition? Good. That's actually one of the uh, one of the core elements that Vision Synergy offers uh, because we, we're kind of a uh, an a process oriented group uh, and the process that we advocate and and do is a process of leading a group through that uh, that you've just described um, and this is where a lot of networks get get you know stuck um, what we do is um, a, a kind of a roll-up process where we uh, have groups perhaps in tables suggest what are the big challenges that you're facing and you let's have your your table develop um, your top three, develop consensus on the top three that your table group does, and then that's shared to the large group. And we begin to the, see then the variety of challenges that people are encountering as they try to work on their, the, the, their uh, area that we've identified. And then uh, remarkably, when you do that, you'll find that it's not uh, 60, 80 different things. It actually, there's there'll be a high degree of overlap so that it, even going through that process, you'll be able to begin to see quite easily the, the six, eight, 10 uh, greatest challenges that people attempting to work on your focus are encountering. And then mm -hmm. see if there's some way to group these until you can get down basically to the group affirming uh, one or two, for instance, that are, that are, um, that we all think are valuable and high value, high uh, impact if we were to address them together, mm -hmm. and that they're the kind of thing that we couldn't otherwise uh, address unless we work together, and then have mm -hmm. that be your initial thing. Yep. So let me just end with one question, because I uh, we've got most of them answered, a few okay. more that um, we might be able to answer offline. Um, but so one, one person says, we're trying to build a network of American Indian alumni across Minnesota, urban, rural, and tribal communities. And we have a collaborative of six programs and over 2,000 alumni. We've been building this vision for five years. Have you worked with identity-based network building, and do you, uh, do you help provide training and et cetera for networks? Um, uh, yes, we have worked with identity-based uh, network building. I love the phrase. And, um, and, and yes, we do training. Um, I mean, we even have a self-paced uh, network leadership um, or facilitator training on our website, uh, synergycommons.net, um, as well as um, some other avenues for training that, that we provide, especially, of course, for the networks that we um, specifically advise, and that's a couple of dozen mm -hmm. global networks. Um, 
there are other training opportunities and and um so when you're looking for trainings for a trained facilitator you know find one and and uh, talk to them about where they're getting help and you'll see uh that um groups like nlta are where you can find that you can join uh with peers and and discover that and don't don't mm -hmm. neglect that uh, some of the training may be in odd places so it may be in conflict mm -hmm. resolution areas it may be in right. um it may be in um the kind of the the econometric side of things or, or there's a, a wide variety of of ways that uh that network facilitators and leaders can find uh to to augment their skills but i yeah. i'm in favor of it and please do it because um and make it a habit to, mm -hmm. to um, seek out uh, mentoring training and coaching okay yeah, you just actually answered most of our remaining questions, just a couple there. But I wanted to add, you know, because of our interest at, at the NLTA, we have our breakout sessions now on facilitation and one on conflict resolution because of people's specific interest. And it's a couple of questions here that we didn't answer were about, you know, how do I get more um, training on facilitation? So I'm glad you just spoke to that. Um, just just to, I think there's just kind of one that is really outstanding. Um, that says, what are examples of tools used for secure communication? So that's something also you might specifically speak to that others might not be able to. So I thought, let's get you, let's get you now. <laughs> this is where we have, you know, fortunately we have people like um, the head of security for NASA, JPL, and for um, uh, computer companies and others that are that are um, assisting us in understanding these. And of course, it's in the news, you know, with Apple and the FBI and so mm -hmm. on, um, and. But um, uh, a couple of tools that I just say is uh, uh, vc.com for vi uh, visual uh, conference calls. Um, Vsee.com. It's a true peer-to-peer -peer, um, collaboration um, video uh, collaboration. Um, of course, okay. one of the best practices is to have an online collaboration site. So you're not emailing stuff back and forth, but you you all go into that site and and uh, find what you need there. Your resources are there. You're communicating between your work team inside that uh, secure site, and that's a best practice that um, we see. Um, then that that deals with the major flaw, which is email and endpoint. It's always endpoint that is the biggest uh, vulnerability for communication. Um, and and an online collaboration site, for instance, just a secular, a business um, a solution is uh, glasscubes.com. Mm -hmm. uh, there's many, many. Of course, there's scores of different uh, ones that do this, but. Um, uh, if you can help your network develop a discipline of working within that kind of place, um, you'll, you will see uh, direct results in a sense of being informed and uh, part of a community and um, progressive work on your, your task. Nice. Well, you know, I think it's always a good sign when um, quite a few of the people who are on the webinar are still there, even after the time is over. So, Dave, I think that really um, shows a lot of folks have uh, have already written in to say thank you. Um, I think we all appreciate so much what you have to offer in this space and um, are really thank thrilled you. that you were willing to do this for all of us today. Um, Melinda, um, will, who has signed up almost everyone on this, will um, put together a follow-up email and what we like to do is send a link out to the recorded webinar um, Dave's presentation and then um, some of his resources that he's mentioned and surely his resource list but we'll include all of that in one email so that folks who were on the call and are wondering how to remember all this can can find it um, and if you had a specific question about certain resources that Dave mentioned you might go ahead and um, ask us specifically you can follow up with him or with us um, but you know, we really want to make sure that this is a place that you can think of coming back to and and finding some of those answers. So, mm -hmm. um, so we're going to go ahead sign off. Um, Thank you, Dave. Thanks again. Yeah, you do terrific work, and it's a real pleasure to have had you here today. Thanks.